Cool. So, Nick Williams, uh, pleasure to have you join me for the podcast today. Thank you very much for uh, making the trip down from North London to the London Bridge studio here. Northwest London. Northwest London, sorry. <laughs> um, how are you? I'm good, thank you. Yes, yeah. very well. Good, good. Beautiful day. Yeah? Yeah. Nice. Well, I'm glad to have you here for this conversation. Thank you and I have had some some interesting chats um, about this uh, this kind of topic and this area of the procurement world. You've got some fantastic experience on the procurement side, which we can delve into and no doubt draw forth some kind of examples uh, with what we're discussing today. Um, and what we're discussing today is a nice kind of like title you propose around or areas we're looking at around heroes and storytelling. Good. I like that. Mm. Um, looking at changing the game in services procurement. I wasn't suggesting that I was a hero of any type. Well, we'll we'll have a look at that. We'll I make, just make that clear from the... We'll, we'll make the judgment on that later. Um, so, so first of all, do you want to just give a little bit of background? You're currently Chief Services Procurement Officer at Hayes. Great title. Yeah, very cool. Made that, I made that myself. Well, you know, that's one of the things that I wanted to discuss with you, actually, is in terms of that title and, and, and the market and the recognition of services procurement as a thing. Mm. Um, but before we come on to that, can you just give a little bit of background and context as to how you became the uh, CSPO at Hayes? <laughs> that's when it becomes a bit of a mouthful. Yeah. Um, well, that's a good question. I, I, I don't know, really. Um, if you really ask me the answer to that, then I would have to say uh, I, I've taken a path that is uh, just about helping people. Right? Right. It sounds a bit trite, I know, but that's the thing that drives me. I started off in engineering, I went into sales, uh, I went into uh, education for a bit, did some training and, and teaching, went into consulting, and then I ended up in procurement. Um, but the thing that's driven me all the way through is just yeah, helping people to do things better. I don't know, I don't know why that drives me, but but that's what it is. So whatever uh, path that I've taken has always been about, okay, how can I help you to do things better? Whether I'm selling you something that's going to help you in your business, or whether I'm training and teaching you to help you be better at a certain thing, um, whether I'm buying stuff for you that, that makes your business better uh, or helps you to engage with procurement function. Um, yeah, I think that's what it is. And, and now I'm helping Hayes, if you like, to relaunch, reinvigorate, refresh services procurement on a global basis. So it's fantastic. And is that kind of like, is that a personality trait in the sense? Yeah, I think I think maybe. Guy, if, if, if there's something that's not being done right, can you just leave it? No, I can't. Exactly. <laughs> that's the point, probably. Um, yeah, I do like helping people wherever they are. Um, you know, my personal life, I spend a lot of time helping my kids. I've got four kids. My wife's got two kids. Uh, so between us, we have six and we're helping them all the time. And I think that's just something that, that drives me. And that's just my mentality. And you're right. I don't like to see if I feel that things could be done uh, uh, in a different way that is perhaps better for the people concerned. Uh, I feel that uh, I'd like to try and help them. And that's what that that's what drives me. Yeah, I think so. One thing I find quite interesting about the um, the kind of core what I would class as the services procurement community, people that are really focusing on this as a thing, hmm. it's it problem solvers. Yeah. Very much that problem solving yeah. mentality of a complex issue, an emerging area where there aren't just completely prescriptive solutions that are just, you know, decades old and, and very much run of the mill. Hmm. It's a, it's an area for problem solvers. Yeah. I, I, and, and I have been called a problem solver amongst other things. That was a more polite thing that I was called. Um, uh, you know, amongst being an interferer, <laughs> go away and leave us alone, Nick. Um, yeah, I, th I, I think you're right. That's what really fascinates me about this bit of, of business, this services procurement, because it is so complex. It's really simple, but it's also so complex because you have different people involved for different reasons, uh, with different challenges, and every almost every deal that I look at. Um, is different for different reasons and people are doing things for different reasons whether it be financial whether it be related to to risk or compliance or governance or whatever it might be everyone's got a different challenge and, and that's what makes it fascinating there's no one size fits all buy one of these and it'll solve all your problems and that that you know that that gets me up every day and keeps me interested i think i'm sure people would definitely agree on the complexity side of it in terms of you know, tying down 
what somebody's buying in a service, defining it accurately, measuring it, capturing it, hmm. take, making the intangible tangible. There's a lot of complexity around services procurement, but you mentioned it's also quite simple as well. Where do you see that kind of core simplicity? Well, it's about the data, right? Uh, God, I sound awful when I say that. That's what everybody says in these pockets. <laughs> well, well, I was going to say, but it, is, but it sort of is, right? It's just about the data and what the data tells you. And I'm not, I'm not a huge uh, 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 sort of data analytics person, right? But the data tells you what's going in, in your, on in your organization. And the more data, the better your decisions can be because you can use that data to help them. So I think it's as simple as that, right? Services procurement is fundamentally about getting the data back out of those the, those deals that you're doing with service providers to then guide you in what your next deal should be. And if you don't look at that, you don't know whether you made a good decision or a bad decision last time. And so how are you going to guide your next decision? Um, and it doesn't matter what the data is, but getting to that data and, and looking at it and understanding it. And it isn't isn't difficult it's pretty comp pretty pretty simple data to 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 get hold of once you understand how to get hold of it and pretty simple to analyze you you you, you don't need a computer to do it you can do it almost by hand so yeah i mean it's when you break it down like that the process of buying services the underlying process it's not uh as my friend always says it's not rocket surgery um, research. um yeah. so you know it's it that process exists it's not the most complicated thing in the world and actually the ability to buy service effectively if you've got the data if you capture the process is actually fairly straightforward um but it feels like it's been made very complicated or people have, have felt like it's too complicated to try and address hmm. um because it's not the same as buying goods and materials um it's not the same as working through that kind of process that's grown from the ERP into the kind of like procure to pay and source to pay world. Oh dear, we're going off into procurement language. Yeah, well, uh, li maybe maybe a little bit, but it's, yeah. It and that's part of the problem in my mind, by the way. Right. So it's interesting you say that, and I was partly joking, but also that is part of the problem that I have come across since working in procurement, that there is this language. And then you start talking to the business, the client, who you're trying to help, and they don't know what you're talking about. But it depends who you're engaging. So, if you uh, would you say that, um, and we're kind of coming on to the topic I wanted to talk about of of, of like mm. who should care about this. Um, do you think in the minds of you know when you're looking at the business and, and solving a problem around this? Mm. Um, so, first of all, let's let's define what is what is services procurement. Um, do you feel like that's a thing that most organizations, if you spoke to the CFO hmm. and said, look, you know, I'm interested in looking at how you guys manage your services procurement. Um, do you think the CFO is going to understand what that is? Do you think they're going to have a clear box? Well, they no, can... they won't. And that's, again, part of the problem, right? Using language that they won't understand. So uh, one thing that procurement's very good at is coming out with their own language and then wondering why their stakeholders can't get engaged right. or won't get engaged. Um, so, no, I think the services procurement is... Um, literally that it's procurement of services everything that's not a physical product is a service as long as it's delivered by a person obviously not by a machine but as long as it's delivered by a, a person uh, it's, it's services procurement so it doesn't matter whether it's a piece of marketing work a piece of legal work a piece of audit work a piece of consulting work a piece of security guarding work a piece of res piece, some reception manning work it doesn't matter to me it's, it's, it's just a service that is being provided by people. And that's the way I look at it, and that's the way I encourage everybody to look at it. It's funny, actually, because um, a chap that I've interviewed before who's a, a well-known analyst in the kind of, like, procurement and contingent workforce space, a guy called Andrew Carpy, he always used to very much try and impress upon me, Johnny, it's it's not services procurement, it's the procurement of services. Yeah, he's, and he, he, he's right. That's, what, that's, that, that's effectively what I'm saying. It is. Because as soon as you try and label it, everybody thinks it's this weird and wonderful, complex thing, which frankly, it's not. Yeah. Yeah. And, and obviously, the way that most procurement teams are set up um, is based around categories. Yeah. And that's, that's where the you, other problem. That's where you, I think you get some complexity as well in the terms of the remit yes. of where this kind of spreads. So, yeah, ab absolutely. Again, procurement has, uh, uh, I feel like I'm lambasting the profession here, but... 
you know, in some cases it needs lambasting because, yeah, absolutely. If you look at things in a category, category is effectively a silo, but that the business doesn't care about that. Yes, I will appreciate being a procurement professional and consulting on this for a number of years. Yes, there is a great deal of benefit from specialism in a category, having category people who really know how to buy stuff in a category. But that's not, that, that's only one part of the problem for the business. The business problem is I need this done and I need it done next week. Right? And this is my business plan and this, these are my objectives and this is my strategic imperative. I, I don't really care how you do it, just get on and do it. So procurement has this responsibility to recognize that. Say, okay, yes, we have category expertise. Um, but it's a good point because most of the meetings I, I, I attend now um, have somebody from the HR category and from the consulting services category and perhaps from the talent part of the business and from the HR part of the business all in the same room. Otherwise, I don't bother really attending the meeting because we're not going to get very far. We're going to get stuck when we start talking about other services or other parts of the non-permanent workforce, let's call it, um, where nobody's represented. So you're not going to get the right answer. You're not going to, going to, going to solve the problem. Yeah, and in terms of solving the problem, <laughs> we're talking about the procurement of services that goes across categories. Um, hmm. Some people would define it as being lumped under um, engagements that are carried out under a statement of work. Um, so that's where you get the kind of statement of work mm -hmm. terminology being used within it. Mm -hmm. um, what's your view on that side of it? Uh, just to put the context around that, the recent Staffing Industry Analysts um, CWS Summit in London um, Peter Regan was putting forward, I saw an article he put out on this as well. Um, he put forward an argument to say the contingent workforce industry talk about SOW or SOW management or SOW spend management, statement of work, mm. contractual vehicle. Mm. And he was like, we shouldn't be talking about that. We shouldn't be talking about services procurement. We shouldn't mm. be talking about outsourcing. Mm. And it was interesting to hear some people kind of latching onto that and saying they agreed with it and other people saying, well, you know, outsourcing is more that kind of outsourcing of an entire function, offshoring it. Or, or, or other methodologies around that, whereas actually procurement of services covers a broader range and there's a broader range of engagements that would sit under statement of work type contracts. Um, do you think that needs, is that something that needs people in the industry to, to try and define it more clearly or do you think it's going to work itself why out? Do we, why do we spend time trying to define it? It's, just, it's a thing, right? There's two main things if you think uh, about business. If you run an organisation, you have your permanent workforce, and then you have your non-permanent workforce, right? And uh, in my view, personally, you're talking about the non-permanent workforce. End of story. I don't care if you're a lawyer, a consultant, a receptionist, security guard, driver. doesn't matter. A marketing expert. You're the non-permanent workforce. So why do we need to categorize it as anything? It's just that, right? It's people who work for your organization in some form. They're either changing your organization, building your organization, transforming your organization, securing your organization whatever they're doing they're not on your payroll so as far as i'm concerned they're in scope and so let's let's look into that a bit further so when we talk about the people providing the service obviously i'm assuming you're including the contract contractor and temp workforce within that or are you saying they're on the payroll no i would say that they are on they are non-permanent employees in the same way um but the difference is they might be doing stuff on a, on a on a time basis versus then something that is put together as a service. Yep. So you do have to then differentiate, I think, yep. because they are different models and you have to govern them in different, slightly different ways. And there are other also regulations around, you know, what you can do and what you can't do. So yes, when you, when you start dropping down to the next level, yes, you do have to start doing some element of segmentation, of course, but generally if you talk to a CEO or a CFO, there's the perm staff and the non-perm staff. Basically, they want to understand, <clears throat> pardon me, they want to understand how can I get things done? What's the total capacity of my organization? Yeah. What What's my what's my overall capability when I include my supply chain? Um, yeah. And I think that's getting more and more important for organizations as the dynamic, that internal versus external workforce yeah. shifts. Yeah, there's a lot of reasons why that's happening, right? So... Uh, 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 it's very much more difficult today to recruit the right staff on a permanent basis. Um, business changes very quickly. Needs the, the demand on business for specialist skill sets or 
um, developing business in different areas, globalization. We don't have a, you know, you want to jump into Southeast Asia or you want to jump into APAC and you, you don't have a, uh, a, 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 a your own business there. It will take you time to do so. You might want to uh, employ some uh, services to help you get up and running in those places, right? And that's that that's that's normal. Um, and yes, on top of that, you've got the difficulty of recruiting people and, and retaining people uh, because the job market is very fluid. People, if they're any good, will move from company to company. So yeah, the perma the non permanent workforce is much more important to uh, the C suite than it's ever been, and for 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 those reasons and many others. Um, so we've lost a thread of what we were, well, where we were going with. Just you know, no, we were just talking about the kind of like the bifurcation. So when you drop, if you say, okay, you're procuring services, it's effectively your non um, non permanent non employee yes. capacity yes. to to do work. Um, so you mm -hmm. can you can get work done in different um, modalities. You can get your permanent staff to do it. Yeah. You can get contractors and temps to do it on a yeah. on an individual time basis. You can get gig workers to do stuff. You can get yeah. freelancers to do stuff. Yeah. Um, or you can get a service provider to deliver things on an output or outcome basis. Um, so that all fits into that overall work. That's your non per Well, I recall your non perm workforce that you've talked about there. And yes, you need to manage each part of that carefully uh, within within the realms of your business rules and and regulatory rules. But I think it's as as I I. I I genuinely believe it's as simple as that, particularly if you're at that level of the organization. If you start looking at the spend on services across any company, mostly at 60 to 70 percent of the spend is related to services in some in some point of view. Yeah, This country is a, is, a, is a massive service industry economy, so we buy and sell uh, many, many services. Uh, so... I would think that most annual reports will, will suggest that the amount of third-party spend, and I've seen this time and time again with procurement spend analytics, most of it is services. 60%, 70% is services of some kind. And that's where the CFO is interested, and frankly, the CEO will be interested because that's over half of what they're spending to, to operate your business is, is through services with third parties. Yeah, and I've... Um... Through people like A.T. Kearney, um, the research they've done would suggest that globally, it's basically 50% of organizational spend on average across all industries. Yeah, so and I would say that the UK is is higher than that. But yes, globally, I would accept that's probably right. Yeah, exactly. An engineering and manufacturing company is going to have a greater um, proportion towards uh, direct spend or, sorry, uh, goods and material type yes, spend. Absolutely. But, um, you know, likewise, a bank's going to be probably, an investment bank might be 95% services. Yes. Um, I always find it quite interesting when, again, don't want to get too much into terminology and, and the attempt at categorization. I like your approach of keeping it simple. But this whole idea of direct versus indirect, I find mm. confuses things slightly sometimes because if it depends what type of company you are. It's, you know, Services could sit in either direct or indirect spend. If you are um, an Atkins or a WSP, like a you know building infrastructure consultancy, your, your direct costs are effectively services where you're you know you're subcontracting yeah um and your indirect are probably going to be goods not for resale like laptops and things like that mm -hmm. um whereas in um you know an engineering company it might be completely different so so it's i feel like there is to get through to where the the nub of this is you, you need to be really approaching this from a very top level listening to what you're saying because who should care about it that's the next point i wanted to get onto. who should care about this um, there's various people that I think potentially should care about it, but when you consider the amount of spend that's involved in it, who do you think this should be something that somebody who should within organizations should be worrying about this? Well, everybody should be worried about it. <laughs> of course, if it's half of what your organization spends, yeah, everybody should be worried about it or, or, or understand it at least. Going back to your point about, yeah, it's a sea level conversation. I think the the fundamentals of it are sea level conversation. Yeah. So, do you know how many non-permanent employees you've got, Mr. Mr. or Mrs. CEO? Do you know? The, the answer I get to that question is not really. A lot of the time. So that's worrying for a start. Um, and something, therefore, to, to investigate. Um, going back to your previous point about direct or indirect, yeah, it's down to a, a good procurement function 
to understand the business, understand the type of organization it is, and build their operating model around that that suits the business, that's going to give them the best result. So that's the answer to that, I think. Um, but everybody should be worried about it, yeah. So, And everybody is is worried about it. I don't know if that's the right term, but everybody's it should be interested. Obviously, the CFO should be interested from, from a financial management perspective, from a forecasting and budgeting perspective. Uh, the, uh, the, the tech function needs to be worried about it. Have we got the right technical expertise in the right place? Are we paying the right amount of money? We're developing, the, we're using third parties to develop products, services, operate our business. How, how well are we doing that compared to our competitors? You know, what do we do to optimize it? Um, the legal function, you know, are we getting the right lawyers in? Are they the best lawyers for us, for our organization? Do they give us the right advice and are we paying the right amount of money? And are we are we optimizing our engagement with the law firms to to do their their job? It doesn't matter who it is. Everybody in the organisation should have a view because I I would expect that pretty much every C level member, every C suite member, uh, will be using third parties at some point during the year. I do deliver for them either in an indirect or direct capacity. Yeah, yeah, I I agree with you. I, but do you think it's one of those things where? everybody feels like it's maybe someone else's problem or someone else's responsibility in the sense that everybody's got a stake in it within the organization or a large number of parties have got a stake in it within the organization. Um, but whose problem is it? Who owns it? Who's responsible? Well, I, I, I think the, the, well, probably procurement, right? That's your, that's, that's the place that you go in an organization to, to buy stuff. And if procurement is not able to advise you correctly in that space uh, and you don't feel that you're going to get that you'll you'll make your own decisions which might not be the right decisions and that's so it's procurement's challenge and opportunity to address this in the right way which is understanding the business understanding stakeholders what is the challenge what is the strategic uh, uh, imperative for my business as a whole and for my stakeholders business within that and then how do I design a procurement strategy around that that optimizes whatever they need from me and my function, whether it's the risk element to, to the supply chain, whether it's the uh, uh, geographic requirements for the supply chain, whether it's a, 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 a carbon neutral focus for the supply, whatever it is, then procurement's challenge and opportunity is to, is to address that and, and deliver back to the business uh, a, a, a great service that delivers the, what your stakeholder needs. And in your view, in the procurement teams you've worked in and in the, in the, in the clients and prospects that you talk to, do you think procurement are effectively empowered to do that? Um, good question. Um, well, if they're not, they need to get themselves empowered. If they're not empowered, let me spin that round. If they're not empowered, uh, they need to work out why they're not empowered and then they need to, to change that. Uh, there will be a reason that they're not empowered. It's because the business doesn't uh, accept they've got the skills, capabilities, service model right in order to deliver what the business wants. And again, so I think it's it, it that that's the opportunity. Let's put a, a positive spin on it: the opportunity to to engage with the business in a way that says, "Well, we could do a lot more for you. We're not doing a lot for you. Why? Go and ask the question." Well, that was my next question: was really about whether organisations actually kind of get it when it comes to the opportunity that there is here so we appreciate it's a massive amount of spend I've, I've heard estimates of around kind of like 20 trillion dollars global annual spend um you know it's a big it's number a big number it's a big number but it's you know 50 percent of total organizational spend globally is going to be a big number and whether that's the right number or not it's mm. a big number mm. we know that mm. so it feels like I'm trying to look at this, kind of put, put, put my um, organizational hat on with the companies that we talk to and the problems that we see. It feels like something that's quite hard to pin down um, because it's spread across categories, because, you know, yeah. some areas might be seen as being all consulting, top level strategic consulting sits with a C-suite, not procurement, or procurement teams are generally quite lean. Um, you know, they might not be empowered. They might not be targeted towards this sort of thing. Um, but... But then, so then you've got to look at it from an organizational capacity and go maybe a level higher and go, does the CFO appreciate the opportunity that there is here? But to, to understand the opportunity, we need to understand what's the current baseline 
So how do you think most organizations are managing this type of spend currently? What would you say is the kind of fairly standard? Oh, that model, the model you've talked about in, in categories uh, in silos, if you ask me. Uh, doing a great job in many cases, really understanding the category, but just being focused on the category and targeted on the category. And this is the challenge that procurement faces. And if we look at the life cycle of procuring a service, which part of that would you say typically procurement are targeted on in the sense that do procurement care what happens post-contract in, in most organizations? Because obviously they might be targeted on making you know hard savings at the front end against budget or you know against um, you know kind of going through competitive processes and things mm -hmm. like that. Mm -hmm. um, do you think that's where the majority of the kind of traditional procurement setup is focusing procurement people's attention and yeah. where they feel that the remit is because it's very important to capture what happens post-contract in my opinion because did you get what was promised mm. um, and did it change mm. do you think that where, where do you think that focus lies typically oh, as you say exactly as you say i would say in most cases it is designed around and i've been through many many discussions about you know what's the target for procurement um, and, and I've managed to persuade and influence a, a number of organizations to move away from, yeah, oh, it's the hard savings because they mean nothing in reality, um, which is then the reason that the procurement doesn't maintain and, and develop its seat at the table properly because they're seen as just being savings chasers. And, and nowadays, yes, okay, the, the, the part of the organization we go to, to to help us manage risk in our supply chain because we want our supplies to fall over and that wouldn't be a good thing. Um, so but that's a different dynamic. And then maybe the bit, the organization that helps us you know, meet, meet our targets for, for scope three or, uh, you know, carbon uh, uh, or, or, or DE and I, right? But the reason that procurement are the, are the recipients of those requests is because they often hold the data in one place if they're, if they're working on, uh, you know, if they have contract databases, if they have uh, spend profile information, they have, they're the one place to go. But I don't see that any of that as adding value to the organization. And I think that's the problem. If you're continually focused, I had a conversation with a, a client this week who very proudly told me that they'd gone out to the market. Um, they run a tender for consultancy firms and they'd overall reduced the day rate by 10%. So fantastic. Well done. So my question to him was then, so how are you going to control the fact that the amount of time spent on your work next year will be 15 to 20% more than it was this year? Yeah. Uh, he couldn't answer the question, and I, I don't blame him for that, but that's that's not the way that he's, that procurement is often uh, targeted. Well, I was going to say- Or incentive. Fault, it? Sorry, it's not, it's not his fault. He's given his objectives. The objective is to, to reduce this, and then- that's the problem is that those numbers then go through to be signed off as savings, but the CFO signs them off, but knows they're not real savings because the, the actual spend won't reduce by 10% next year because the volume will change. Yeah. So, and that's a very specific point around consulting spend and the challenge you have in that space. Um, but there you go. It's, it's, it, it, we can even talk about, oh, I want, we're adding value to the business, but until you really understand the how to add that value, and what that means and how it impacts the business. I mean, this is a very big conversation we're having now, right, about, you know, how procurement works. Um, but, yeah, having worked in it uh, long enough, uh, I, I can see that. I see it every day, and I've, I've worked with tens and tens of clients on it, on the same challenge. And this is, again, where it filters up to that C-suite responsibility, whether it's the CPO, whether it's the CFO, to, to really... Um, have some directive to get a handle on this because it does often require some kind of organizational change because the way people are doing it at the moment i would say in majority of cases i see procurement don't have the data on this they might have a bit of data in the lead up they might have data in the sense that they might have the supplier on a you know a top level procurement platform the supplier will be registered with them and they will have probably a statement of work document that might be a scan signed pdf mm -hmm. in a repository somewhere mm -hmm. That's usually pretty much it. No, not usually any information below PO level. And if somebody wanted to say, but what did we actually get for that? And did they actually do it on time? And what was the actual outcome? Then people have literally got to pretty much sift back through paperwork. Mm -hmm. um, so, well, 
Yes and no. I think that's a bit harsh. Do you? Think? Yeah, a little. Uh, you know, I, I mean, there might be a spreadsheet alongside it. <laughs> I think I know where you're going. Well, wait, it's, it's basically that. Yeah, I does. think, I think, yes, in the main. But there are a number of global organisations who have got a handle on this, who do, who are making great strides in 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 dealing with this challenge, uh, and are far ahead of 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 that scenario that you paint. So I think we should we we need to to support them in, in what they're doing because they are investing a lot of money they're investing a lot of time and resource um and and not just with Hayes with 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 all of our competitors to get a handle on this challenge and so absolutely there there are many many examples of organizations that don't but there is a growing set of organizations who really are taking this challenge seriously are making great strides as I say in doing so getting the credibility within their organizations and uh you know at some point hopefully we'll be able to tell the world about what they've done and how they're doing it and uh and people can learn from that what what's it that set these people apart these companies apart how have they done that what is it because because that's not that's not the that's yeah not it's not the, the norm it's not the norm as you said no yeah so so if you if you tried to break down when you look at those companies that are doing it a great job of it hmm where do you think their motivators have come up that's driven them to solve this problem? Well, the people that I've met are doing it are the ones that are a bit like me, I suppose, um, who who are not prepared to accept the status quo and accept that that's just the way it is. Nick, sorry, um, and uh, you know they are they are people who ask questions, who are curious, who who, as I say, you know, think there is a better way to do this. This is a bit mad. What what uh, and. And just have that mindset of, uh, I want to do something about it. In addition to that, they're probably the people uh, who are prepared to put their head above the parapet and go and talk to the people they need to talk to in their organizations. They're curious. They ask questions. They go and find out what's going on. Why is this not working? What can we do? What would we need to do to change this? Uh, because this could be better. And are prepared to take some risks and saying, well, yeah, okay, it's not the normal way of doing things, but if we think about it in this way, well, you know, how would that look to you? How would this new model sit within the organisation? How will we get it to work? And they're not, you know, are prepared to get out from behind their desks, work with the the business, uh, understand how each each of their stakeholders is motivated, targeted, uh, what the what 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 they're trying to achieve, and as I say, not prepared to accept. Oh well, that's just the way it is. So the people that I've met that are really good at this are those people are saying, I want to be better than I am. I want my procurement function to be better than it is, and I'm going to go and do something about it. Yeah, uh, it's so. Is this where the heroes come into our discussion? Are these the, are these the heroes of the narrative? Yeah, I think you could call them heroes because it's really tough. Yes, you know, yeah. Um, and yeah, it is. Uh, you know, as the, a CPO or a head of procurement that goes to the board and puts data in front of the board and says, "Listen, this I think is a problem," and is prepared to talk to the board and uh, prepared to get engagement at that level, because that's what I'm talking about. And you mentioned, you mentioned this when you were talking through it, that it's that going up a, a level, up a level. Because everybody at the uh, at levels below the executive suite are just interested in running their businesses, right? That's that's what they've got to do. But this, the higher you get in the, up in the organization, you're looking across everything that's going on. And that can be a scary place. So yeah, anyone who does do that, I think is a hero and, and would, would bring that to the attention of their C-suite and say, listen, I think we should do something different about it. They have to go with a good story. They have to prepare, but they have to put themselves out there. And as I say, get out from behind the desk. Yeah. And I, I do, I do agree. It is, it is putting their head above the parapet, which by its very nature is feels risky, feels scary. Just, yeah. just you know, it don't rock the boat. Yeah. I, I had another conversation yesterday with somebody else and we're talking about training, learning and development for procurement. Uh, and I'm looking at it from the other side. So how can I get my sales teams uh, within Hayes to understand what procurement have to do better? So we've got some really good examples of working very closely with procurement, but not enough. And then from the other side of the coin, I'm thinking, well, how well do procurement sell themselves within the organization? It's a very good and, point. And that is, a, that is a thing, right? That procurement are almost anti-sales in many cases. Uh, and I have a lot of experience of of that happening within organizations where I would ask the question of, you know, how do we solve this problem? Well, let's just pick up the phone to the supplier 
and procurement saying, oh, well, no, we can't talk to the supplier. We're not in a process. Well, how are you going to be able to solve your internal stakeholders challenge if you don't really understand the service that we're buying and how we're buying it and what we can do to, you'll probably find that the supplier will tell you, yeah, actually, you're buying completely the wrong thing. We've been telling you this for three years. If you buy this thing, it'll solve your problem overnight. Now, obviously, that's a yeah, very simple, perfect scenario, perfect scenario which won't exist. But an element of some of that will exist somewhere. Mm-hmm. And and I've or you know, I came from the sales side of of uh, uh, my career, and I stepped into procurement from sales. So I was doing big ticket ticket sales in um, in the tech space for Vodafone, Cable and Wireless, uh, successfully for a number of for m- many years. And um, my best deals were when procurement people really understood and listened to me and I could help them, again, help them solve their problem. And and I think that uh, procurement, again, has a really good opportunity to address that and sell themselves to the business and sell themselves to the supply chain as being that conduit between the two. Uh, many sales organizations will bypass procurement because they think they're going to, and in many cases will get, tied up in some sort of process which is not going to help anybody and i think we need to as a as a as a as a profession address that better and and work out how we can how we can bring those two together as a as a much more effective conduit i 100 percent agree and certainly as a kind of a, a tech provider in this industry that's where we've done our absolutely our best work is where people have just said, look, this is our problem. Just to, just help yes. solve the problem. Yes, that is where they get the value out of their suppliers because they're just they they're getting they're, they're not just saying just just do what you normally do. They're saying, mm. okay, you, so you're saying you've got expertise in this area. You're saying you can help. Let's work on this. Let's mm. solve this problem. That's I mean that's the fun of it for me. I mean I'm you know very much uh, of the same ilk as yourself in terms of mindset. I love problem solving. It's what it's all about, and um, I think that's what's where the industry that we're talking about here, this problem solving exercise, it's a big one. Hmm. Um, and most of the people that are involved in it, that are actually making movement in it are that problem solving mentality. They're not willing to just settle. They yeah. want to push things. Yeah. That's where they're kind of like taking these heroic actions of probably rocking the boat quite significantly, upsetting people, making the why, yes. why are you worrying about that? You know, we've been yes. doing this for years. Yes. Um, what, what are Going back to those successful companies. So we talked about, um, you know, how and why. So it's these these people making a change, these these heroes stepping forward to actually demand that this be looked at and actually make the case, make the statement, ask the questions, be curious. Mm. Um, so that's quite an individual thing. Mm. Um, so one other quick question associated with that, which has just come into my head, which is where do you typically see the, the executive support coming into that? Does it come from like the CFO? I guess it depends who's trying to make these moves, but so you get your hero come forward and say, "Come on, everybody, this isn't this isn't as good as it could be. Let's 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 do something better." Um, they're going to need to get some executive support from somewhere. Do you see that coming from different places, or is it typically the CFO kind of going, "Yeah, that would be really good," or or is it coming from different places? The the place I've seen it most successful is when it's the CEO. Right, the CEO has taken responsibility for everybody uh, in the organisation, and clients that I've talked to about this have said the same thing. And if I want to 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 get my program initiated, thought about, engaged with, working, it's the CEO who has to do that. So a, a client told me recently um, that that she ended up having to take her plan to a board meeting, and the CEO was at the head of the table very traditional sense, CEO at the end of the table, all of the C-Street sitting out of the side. She she was a, a hero in presenting her, I think we should do things this way. Once she persuaded the CEO to move to the next stage, the CEO said, you work with every single member of the C-Street to get this to happen. Mm. I've had similar, and those are the best, because you have that executive engagement, you have that license to get the time with the people at the right levels, uh, which can be all, all across the organization to get time with them to understand, okay, this is what we're trying to do. How would it impact you? What what benefits do you, would you need to see out of this? Um, yeah, so it, there, there is a, there's a role in it for the CEO to give direction to, to the board to say, yeah, this is a thing. This is really specific in services procurement because of that 
point we talked about right at the beginning. It covers everybody. It well, covers it everything. Everything. Yeah. Lawyers, marketing, yeah. consulting, audit. Everybody has a, a as as IT. I mean, IT and tech probably the biggest spenders on services in any organisation, particularly in banking and finance. Multi billions. So if your CTO CIO is not being asked by their boss, the CEO, to look at this, why are they going to look at it? They've got a million things to do. Mm. But if the CEO thinks it's a good idea, so will the CTO or CIO. Yeah, it, a, a great CEO once told me, um, Johnny, that one of the most important questions I can ask about my organization is, what is my total available resources? Mm. What have I got to work mm -hmm. with? How can I get mm -hmm. stuff done? And where does that sit? What mm. what expertise have I got? What's my what's, yes. my what's the capacity and capability of this organization? Yeah. And that's what they that that's the right question to be asking. And then that flows beautifully into services, doesn't it? Because it's like, okay, so this is our capacity capability of our permanent workforce that we work really hard to recruit and retain and train and and give them the best that we can give them, right? And and the brand and the employee value proposition, et cetera, which we spend a lot of money on. But then there's probably another 30, 40, 50% of people in that organization who are non-perm. So what's happening with them? Because they're, they are intrinsic to the solution for the business succeeding. And the CEO who recognizes that is a bright CEO. They're probably also going to recognize that the kind of battle for talent, um, particularly in new emerging areas of technology, um, and areas of new regulations and things like that, it, it's just as fierce competition within the services provider Absolutely. Place as it is within the workforce. The yes. Core work. Yes, it is. So, so we can see what sets these organisations apart. You've got individuals who are w willing to, um, you know, step forward and take on the challenge. You've got uh, a leadership team recognise this when it's brought to them that there's an opportunity. Mm -hmm. Um to actually move forward with something here what what do you see them what do you see them gaining from it so when when organizations are doing this really effectively what looks different about them or what what benefits are they getting from doing this i think that the one single benefit they get is the ability to know better than they do today that they're making the right decision I think it's. A, you know, I, I do like simple things, right? Now, uh, not a very complicated. You condensed phrase. that very nicely. <laughs> but condensed it, that very nicely. But well, what else is there? Right? So, so uh, if you've seen your person in an organisation, you need to get thing done. Things done. You need to know that the decisions you make are as good as they can be, right? Um, because you don't want it to get screwed up, do you? You want it to happen. You want it to work. You don't want to over overspend on your budget. You want the product that you're trying to market to get to the market to actually be delivered. Or you want the service that you're trying to improve to be improved because you're targeted on that. As part of your objectives, you're probably bonused on it. So you want to be able to make the right decision. Without the data, how do you make the right decision? Oh, I've worked with this person before and they did a good job for me here, so I'm going to bring them in to do a good job for me here. That makes sense. Yeah, and that's quite, what happens, right? Yeah, if, if you, so you'll get you get you the 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 exec will pick up the phone and say to the partner of a consulting firm, "Oh, you come and work for me X Y Z. I'm now working at ABC. Come and do the same thing you did there, right? But it could be a completely different industry. It could be a completely different set of problems. Well, that's half the battle of measuring performance, supply performance in in the procurement of services. Absolutely, because every project's different. And every company is different that that project is delivered for, and the time is different, and the and the and the requirements are different every time. We all, you know, I used the example of a consulting firm, be the same for a marketing firm. They might work great in FMCG, but you put them into tech, and they, they you know, it's a different thing for them. A law firm could be the same thing, right? So, uh, it, it, the ability to to make the right decisions and having that data set, part of it is yes, existing supplier performance. And supplier segmentation, categorization, classification, are the right sort of, do they have the right sort of uh, capacity, capability to help us? Well, if the procurement function is not all over that, mistakes will be made because if you're the exec who goes to procurement and procurement don't have that data, and I'm not saying that they can't get it, they can go out and get it, 
but you need that all in, within your organizational model that, that that's available at any point yeah and it's built up there is relevant data to your organization it's not just an external benchmarking exercise you need to 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 understand that and um if you don't do that then how are you able to support your stakeholders in making the right decision yeah and it takes away the complexity if you capture that data you, you every, yes every project is still different yes every organization is different um things change over time you might get internal issues that delay a project or make it cost more you might get mm -hmm. supplier issues that do the same mm. but if you're capturing the information on what was promised yeah what was delivered when was it delivered how well was it delivered mm -hmm. you know what changed what mm -hmm. was the, what was the cost uh, cost overrun on average for this supplier mm -hmm. across mm -hmm. all of the projects they worked on versus other suppliers cost mm -hmm. overruns you can even compare cross category and then why why are they overrunning on cost are we specifying it wrong in the first place are they undercooking it when they're coming in to bid for the work to win it? Those sorts of questions as well. There's beautiful data to be had, um, but I do feel like in in most scenarios that I see, um, the the what you talked about, the people who've got this completely, you know, nailed, they are the exception, not the rule, in what I see in the market. And I think a lot of people are just missing out on the opportunity because it's kind of institutionalized in the way that people do it in in a not very effective manner. Um, and it's something that people have been doing for a decent amount of time. It's not like, you know, buying services is particularly new, but it has grown very rapidly and the world has become a more service dominated place. Um, so, so moving on a slightly different tack here, we talked about who the heroes are, <coughs> pardon me. Whenever there's a hero, my, my voice is a bit croaky because as I meant to do earlier, we had a work night out and there was karaoke. And I think my singing might have been mainly shouting. You told me it was karaoke. You didn't tell me what you'd sung. Um, yeah, we, we don't need to go into you that. Don't need to? I can't actually even remember. How about that karaoke stays at karaoke? I, there were several songs were brutally murdered um, by me and others. Mm. Um, but yeah, so generally when there are heroes, yeah. there are villains. So in this scenario... Who could be? Who are the villains in this in this scenario? Let's get controversial. Yeah, I mean, I'm not sure their their people are villains. Uh, we talked about individual people being heroes. Individual people can be heroes. I I haven't found anybody really who doesn't want this to happen. Uh, maybe it's more a, a villainous mindset. Yeah, I think that's more like it. It's a it's a laziness, right? Dare I say? Oh, it works. It's okay. I hit my numbers. You know, we're all good. You know, I've made it through another year. I made it through another quarter. Whatever. I think. I. I think. Lack of curiosity is a villain. You know, why would you what not want to understand it? Do you, you know why would you not want to try and support a a a, a, a betterment of your business? Um, fear. I think fear is a is a real villain in this. Oh, I'm scared of going to ask people. Um, Lack of personal gain um, is another one. I don't understand why this would be good for me. Um, so those sorts of things, I think, are the villains in this. I mean, people people generally only buy things because they're scared, they need something to happen, or there's some personal gain, or they're feeling some pain. All right. So the pain aspect in this one isn't isn't very obvious because this stuff happens. It's been going on for years. Is anybody in real pain over it? Not really. Well, so why not? That's that. not a great driver. That's yeah. not a great driver. Fear. Mm. Well, you know, if we've misclassified a couple of thousand workers, well, have you? And would the regulator know want to know about that? And what would happen if the regulator did? Many, many companies have been fined hundreds of millions of pounds for misclassification of workers. But have we heard about many of them? No. I've got some examples, but. There's not that many that that have breached to the level of fear that, you know, frankly, if I'm a CEO in an organization, I'd want to know what my organization was doing about classification of work. Very simple thing. But, you know, I don't, I don't want to come up against HMRC like anybody else, right? And if I'm a CEO of a, of a large company, why would I want to invite that sort of investigation? So there is a bit of fear, but it, it there's not enough fear. And personal gain, well... What do I gain from it as a procurement person? I, I, I've just got to do my job and, and, and show that every year I'm doing something a bit better. So those are the things that, those are the, so the villains then that come out the back of that is, well, you know, people are just don't, are not curious or, or, 
are, um, I hate to say they're lazy. People are not lazy, but they, they, they might they, they might have the opposite of fear in terms of, well, I don't want to put my head up against the, uh, above the parapet um, because that's going to make my life you know, more difficult. And do you think that exists when we talk about these kind of like uh, three horsemen of the uh, popular ser service, of, <laughs> service of laziness, fear, and lack of personal gain? Um, <laughs> so do you think that exists mainly within procurement or... Well, no, it exists everywhere, obviously, but, but, but in, in this scenario, is that something that's also existing within the buying population? Is that something that's also existing within the C-suite potentially? Is that something? I don't know. I, I was, it was a massive generalization and I genuinely, when I meet clients, which I do on a weekly, daily, often daily basis, uh, and I sit and talk to them, I think the procurement people that I work with are brilliant. Are they really trying to do something here? They really, you know, and they're asking for our help, and that's great because I love helping people. So, yeah, they, they are desperate to, 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 in many cases, to say, this is wrong, I want to do better, how do I do better? And those are the best conversations for me to have is, is well, of course, great. If you've got the, if you're not being lazy about it, if you're not scared, but you want to do it in the right way, um, and you see some personal gain because, and there is personal gain. There's a lot of personal gain yeah. procurement to get this right. I mean, frankly, I'm a good example of it, of personal gain. I, it's done done great guns for my career. I know you, um, you've run some specific transformations in this area, and that's been very yeah, beneficial absolutely. to you personally. Totally. I, I think we're going to see more people. I hope so. Come forward like that, like you say. Some of these examples, it, it's washing through the market. It's starting to wash through the market more now. Yeah. Um, yeah. Like when you go to conferences and you see people talking about it, it's. You know, the majority of people in those sessions that I've seen are kind of just wanting to hear, yeah. they're wanting to understand because they're, th they're thinking, oh, yeah, well, I want to ask questions. I feel like they probably got the same problems I've got. Well, I'm almost scared to ask. Yeah. But the people that can actually stand there and talk authoritatively about that, there's more people starting to come forward now who generally, genuinely mm. done this on a big scale. Mm. Um, and there is massive personal gain for them. Mm. Huge. Yeah, and those that are prepared to and and wish to invest will do well out of it. Uh, it takes a you know it's not an easy thing to do. And as I say, you know, the, going back to your point about heroes, yeah, the, the, the clients of mine and and my friends and colleagues who have done well in this space are the ones that have dusted themselves down, prepared themselves, lent into it, you know, stepped out of their comfort zone, uh, got in front of the right people, asked some you know quite difficult questions. Um, but actually the benefit that they've achieved from, from doing that and, and not being prepared to sit back and say, oh, well, that's just the way it is, uh, have done well and, and will continue to do well. I'm expecting to see more people start moving to different organizations to actually solve this problem. I, 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 I'm hmm. expecting to see more people to do a very successful transformation within a particular organization and then where could their career go from there it could go on a more generalist basis just up the chain mm -hmm. or actually it could be that they have that specific problem solving expertise that other people within other organizations don't have and they can come in and solve that massive problem for potentially massive benefit within that organization over a three to five year period yeah i think if i was um, encouraging somebody to 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 think about this and and map out their career i think the good thing that you have with a procurement aspect you can work in any industry. Yeah. This is services procurement, right? It's cool, you know, bring us back to that, what we're calling it. So, but everybody does it. We've said, you know, it's 50% of, of everybody's global spend. So it doesn't matter what the organization is. Yeah, their percentage might be different in, in different categories, but it's services procurement. So if you nail it in one place, there's no reason why you can't nail it in others because the principles remain the same. It is getting third party organizations to do stuff to, to change or run your organization. Um, and if you can get your head around how that works and, and optimizing that environment, you can go and do that anywhere. So you mentioned earlier, you said, you know, yes, it's hard when these people step forward and try to make these changes. But do you think organizations think it's harder than it is in terms of their expectation around like, you know, organizational change process change things and you know supplier relationship change i mean i've i've seen 
massive positives in all those areas. But mm. I feel like there's a fear level within organizations that it might be, you know, somebody in procurement stepping forward and or it might be the CPO stepping forward and saying, we can really make some changes here. We can this there's a huge opportunity for um, us to do things better as a business and to get more value from our supply chain and have, to have a more effective um, extended um, capacity. But then you might get finance saying, whoa, 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 hang on a minute. We don't want to change anything here. We, you know, this is, it's not possible. Um, do you think organizations, I know it could come from somewhere else, but do you think organizations think it's harder than it is? I think procurement thinks it's harder than it is. Right. But I think that goes back to that point of if that was the thing, right? Or, oh, you know, finance turning around and say that's not going to work. Nobody would sell anything to anyone, would they? Your organization wouldn't sell your service to anybody because they'd be saying, oh, no, no, we do something else over here, Johnny. Thanks very much. Here, we don't need yours. That's not the case at all. Mm. Um, and having been on that other side of the table from a cold call into somebody to say, look, don't know whether you want to speak to me, but, and then working my way through that organization, then finding out what the problems really were and then oh, I might have a solution and then putting a solution together and then persuading everybody in, in that in, uh, in that decision process that it was right for them. That's just sales. That's just landing your product, landing your service. Yeah, I think, yeah, there will be pushback, absolutely. But there's always pushback. Nobody's going to open the door and say, yeah, of course, procurement, you've got the right answer. Just come and do what you want. Nobody's going to say that. You have to sell it. You have to understand what it would mean to, in your example, the CFO. Why would the CFO be saying that? Yeah, I mean, as I say, I, I sometimes feel that organisations just think it's more difficult than it actually is. It's just like, and again, that comes down to procurement thinking it's more difficult than it actually is. Um, but that leads me on to the next point, which is um, another part of our title, which is about storytelling. Hmm. So you and i in the way that we approach this market we understand this we tell a lot of stories don't we? yeah i mean it but it but it's <laughs> but it's uh it's uh it's part of that process of people understanding and um yeah and people have lots of questions and they want to have things um laid out to them mapped out of to them, explained to them yeah. and one of the one of the easiest ways to um to do that for people and the best ways to take on information is through that storytelling mm. but it kind of goes across everything it goes up the levels doesn't it really yes yeah. oh, yes what 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 sort of have you got any good examples you've seen or maybe any examples of where you've had to utilize that within this area within the when you were perhaps on the procurement side um and what is it about that storytelling that that makes the difference I mean, I, I start to freeze up as soon as you start talking about storytelling. Yeah. Right. And it was out. Because what, what does that really mean? For me, so I always think, well, should I have a story? And then what should the stories have a beginning, middle, and end? And those sorts of things. So I'll be honest with you. Yeah, it scares me about the idea of you know, storytelling. Um, I think what I do, and as I've you know, tried to do today, is to tell you scenarios, examples of where I've done this. And, um, and the things that came out of uh, of that situation. So I think it, it appealing to everybody who might be listening to this, I mean, it, it, when you're starting out in your career versus where you are in my career after 30 years, I have a lot of stories. Why? Because I've done a lot of things in a lot of places with a lot of people. That's much more difficult if you're 28 or even 35 or whatever you might be. It, 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 so... One one piece of advice I would say is get as many stories as you can, right? So that means don't sit behind your desk. Get yep. out, do stuff, talk to people, uh, try things out, and they they will help you develop your stories. Um, but that's as far as I would go with storytelling uh, uh, as as such. I mean, effectively, as you describe it, there storytelling is experience. And yeah, it, it, to, it is the ability to articulate that um, using specific examples that people can relate yeah. to. Yeah. Um, and as you say, the, the storytelling is about the good and the bad. It's about the experience and the knowledge gained of going through a process and looking at how other people achieve great things and where things went wrong. Yeah. And I think if you are looking to get into... Yeah, storytelling is very powerful because what it's doing is bringing to life uh, uh, y y you know, the scenario that you're trying to get across, right? And, it, and it's trying to connect with somebody on the other side of the table or multiple people on the other side of the table uh, 
a, a, a scenario that they might it might chime with them and they say okay yeah no that makes you know it's not exactly the same but it sort of makes sense and that's the power of telling stories for sure it's it's all it's putting a vision in someone's mind isn't it it's putting a it's putting a vision of the future in somebody's mind because what the next question i was going to ask was how can procurement utilize that effectively so say for example we've got someone who's got heroic tendencies they're in a procurement team or they're running a procurement team and they're just saying this is crazy this is not good enough we can do this better mm. i'm going to do something about it mm. um is there any advice that you would give people in that scenario as to how to um, how to get that message across? Or, but bear in mind that they might be starting with not very much data, for yeah. example. Yeah. Or, or are there any ways that you've seen that work particularly well? I, I've, I've seen it work well uh, in, in many scenarios, and, and, and perhaps to answer two questions in one. Uh, and if you haven't got a lot of data, there is a lot of data out there. So just go and find it. So it doesn't have to be your own data. It doesn't have to be your own experience. Um, and depending on where you are uh, on your career path, you can just go and find it. The, the, there are plenty of scenarios out there and news articles and white papers about other organizations that have tried to do different things or done or are doing different things or approach things in a different way. And build your you build your stories from there. So a lot of the things that I'll talk about and not necessarily me or, or anything about but, but, but other other organizations that I've read about or I've spoken to and whatever. I might not have actually been the protagonist in the story, but I might have heard, overheard this. Um, and using that, I, and I think to what, what you're trying to do by telling a story is to bring it to life. So to making it, make a connection with somebody so that when you're telling a story, a number of different elements will be in that story you're not just giving a fact. You're talking about a scenario. And that gives you the best chance of connecting with somebody because it's something you will say in your story will connect with them. And it might be completely outside of what you thought they would connect on. And then we'll start talking about... And then your 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 relationship will then develop, that conversation and relationship will then develop off the back of that one element or two elements of your story. So the story I told about my client, who I spoke to about, um, you know, doing this you know, very valid piece of work, going out to the market, reducing costs. Yeah, great. But then when I asked them about, you know, how are you going to control the the time, the usage, the days, um, that's that spun off into a different conversation very quickly. And I could talk about, well, why was that a problem? Well, because I've I've seen that other organizations they do a great job push the rates right down and the time goes right up and they have very little control over that because in procurement it's too late you know the deal's done you, you set the rate but but then uh, the the supplier w will work out how much they need to work make out of that piece of business and they will they will develop they will design their their solution around making sure they make enough money if the rate is fixed and the days are not, the days are the ones that get moved. And and uh, so that's one scenario um, in which if you, if I tell that story to somebody else, they'll pick up something different out of that. Yeah, I think for me. And the, and the thing that came out of yesterday was just, how do we control the time? Good point. Yeah. Where does the time sit? Oh, well, it sits in the statement of work, doesn't it? Okay. Who agrees what the time is? Oh, probably the supplier. Why is the supplier? Because... The stakeholder has said, this is a piece of work. How long do you think it's going to take? And they will say, oh, 50 days. But if it can be done in 45 days, that's more than 10% reduction. So whatever you've reduced on the day rate, it's got out the window because you're, you're overpaying by 10% on the days. So procurement are fighting a battle all the time. Um, and, and so out of a conversation around that came a out came this discussion around well we're suddenly now talking about how long things take and how long should they take what's the should cost of of a piece of work like this i don't know i don't know myself but wouldn't we like to know how many of these pieces of work do you do every year or every quarter or every week how often are this supplier overrunning yeah i mean that exactly it, it's so what so that story as i say that the idea of store the story i i will now you know I'm using it with you, I'll use it with other people, and I'm hoping and expecting that to drive 
very different conversations about, oh, how much does it cost per day? It costs what it costs, and you can benchmark that as much as you like. But actually, that's not the point. Maybe then the true beauty of that kind of storytelling type communication is what it does is it precipitates questions. Yes, it allows somebody to see. Yeah. Well, it allows somebody to 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 take an interest, to gain an understanding, and to want to know more, and then they can really start probing into it and and uh, yeah. getting into the detail. Because that's that's where, for me, that's where problem solving really becomes interesting, and that's where you get a collaboration, um, where smart people are being curious and asking questions, and if if somebody on the other end is trying to problem solve, if they can. If they can provide that, you know, value and intelligence and solution making capability, now you're in a useful conversation. Yeah, and I wouldn't say that I've got anywhere near the answers. I just sometimes know how to ask the right questions. But there's two things in that. So I focus very much on asking questions, mm -hmm. and I don't care if you think it's a stupid question. I still, you know, want to know the answer to it. Um, and Secondly, I focus very much on who, not how, you're going to solve the problem. And who can solve the problem for you is much more powerful, powerful than how. We all spend a lot of time wondering how we're going to solve the problem, when it's really not our expertise or our job, but there is somebody who knows how to solve the problem. Mm, I like that. So I go for who a lot. So I'll always, if I come away with something, I'm thinking, who knows about this? Who would be a good person to ask? Who would... Who's got some sort of platform? It's one of the reasons that you and I ended up talking is not how. I, I, you know, I could build a model uh, uh, that, that, that provides the solution for my clients. I could do, but why would I want to do that? I'll just go and find somebody who does it. And that's how you and I ended up speaking. And that's how I'm speaking to a range of people. about Who's the real, who really gets this? Who really understands that? It's not how it gets done. Uh, I spend. I think we spend a lot of time on, on worrying about how things get done rather than finding people who can sort us out and help us. Do you know what? I've I've made a little note about that. It, it makes me think of my one of my very good friends um, who he he believes in learning from experts. Whatever he does, he will always pay the money to have an expert show him how to do it. Yeah. It doesn't matter what it is. No. He's, he's, a, he's like a he's done acting. He's a voiceover artist. Um, he, he's got a property development business. Um, he's very good at martial arts. Um, he's actually a very good, um, paddleboard racer. Wow. Uh, but he's all of these Accomplished things. individual. He, he's just, he's all wow, these like things. Him. Yeah. All of these things. Yeah. Um, to a certain extent he's accomplished by leveraging people. Yeah. Leveraging the right, leveraging the who. Yeah. He, he, he always, Johnny just, you know, it's yeah. a, it's a learning training, um, expertise game. Just find the right people who it is. Just a leapfrog. I believe that completely. It, he, because it's, it's a time thing, right? as I say. Yeah. That it's the time thing because we'll spend hours wor worrying about it, thinking about it, researching it. When somebody else has got the answer, to just actually, you spend your time trying to find that person rather than just you know fix it yourself. Yeah, yeah. It's 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 about that investment in expertise, mm. um, and it's you know it's something he's always kind of preached to me. He's a few years older than me, but it, it, mm. he, he's been very good at lots of things, and he always says. You know, I'm nothing special. I just find somebody who tells me what I need to do, and I just follow the steps. Yeah, and and I I I like the simplicity of the way mm. he always describes that. Mm. Um, so yeah, I agree with you on that. I think that's a very important aspect of it. Um, the other side of it that um, kind of came out in what you were talking about there it, with, with some of that stuff is, um, say for example, you've got suppliers that are just rinsing the game, and they're they're absolutely well, you're gamifying the whole situation. Okay. I'll make it look my rate like my rates are cheaper than consultancy B, but I'm always going to overrun. I'm always going to take longer, and that's where you related it back to. It's captured in the statement of work, mm. but the statement of work's a living document. Mm. It changes over time, which mm. is again what separates the procurement of services from the procurement of more binary goods and materials. True, um, and so that comes back to the fundamentals of data, capturing that data and making sure that you always know what's been promised at any point in time mm. and you always know what's been delivered against it. Mm. If you're capturing that information, um, you're going to get a very clear view on whether people have a tendency to perhaps have a typical cost overrun or a typical time overrun uh, or change change things. Um, but like you say, you need to be able to look at that in the context of, well, was it their fault mm. or is there an organizational issue? Mm -hmm. Because that's where I think procurement are in a very interesting place 
in the sense that they have this kind of like internal and external view. Mm. So they, they can see what's going on within the organization. They can see what's going on within the extended supply chain, but they can also see what that supply chain think of what's going on in the organization. You know, that you bring in a consulting firm, and I've seen this in plenty of situations in organizations I've worked at, where consulting firm comes in, they're, you know, wanting to go a million miles an hour solving the problem. And internal stakeholders just aren't turning up to meetings, dragging their heels, they're not prepared, they're, you know, being a stick in the mud, whatever it might be. And it's like, actually, there's an organizational issue that's stopping these guys from doing their job or making it cost more. So the point I'm kind of getting around to here is, I think a lot of people worry about supplier resistance to change in this area. We really don't see that. We see suppliers being actually very grateful for the process, wanting to be recognized for what they're doing, wanting to have more visibility and transparency about the good work that they're doing in most cases. Do you think that's something that people worry about? Yeah, they do worry about it, but I totally agree with you. The, 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 uh, the, every supplier wants the opportunity to show how good they are in whatever form that might take. And uh, no, I think the market is very open to... to I, I think that, that, that there is a... Um, uh, there is a tendency, I think, with some organizations to demonize their suppliers. Right. But the suppliers are often just trying to do the best they can and get the work done and, and, and you know, build more business, right? Uh, I... Uh, very rarely in my career come across a supplier that was genuinely trying to game. I mean, there are some instances where, I mean, they're, they're very clever and that's what, that's what, you know, that's what we forget sometimes. <laughs> Being on the procurement side of the table, these guys know what they're doing. Yeah. You know, you don't think that you know, the big consulting firms and, and even the small consulting firms, which are made of people who are out of the big consulting firm, in many cases, they know exactly what they're doing. An open goal is pretty tempting. Yeah, absolutely, of course. So, it's it's. It, uh, I don't want to demonise them, but yeah, the, it, what 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 uh, I think what you're talking about is no. Uh, we have this conversation quite a lot about you know whether whether our program should be client funded or supplier funded. So it's a really big question. A lot of my clients wrestle with that. You know, what, would I pay or would I ask my suppliers to pay? Well, when you look at the gross margin that most of the suppliers are making in services, eighty ninety percent. Asking them to contribute one, two, three percent towards a program, I don't think they're going to be worried. They're not worried, by the way. I can say that. Um, and why are they not worried? Because it gives they know the program, a services procurement program, they're going to get recognised. Their performance is going to be shown to the right people. They're going to have the ability to get paid a little bit quicker. The statements of work are going to be better. They're going to get a, a purchase order. They're going to be able to start on time, finish on time. They're going to have better engagement from the business. I'm going to save They're money. Really happy. Yeah. And what? We're for one, two, three, three percent, or four percent, or whatever. N not at all. Are they happily? They're making plenty of money. And what this will do is put yourself in the shoes of 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 the other side. If you're a partner in a law firm, you want to guarantee the money's going to come in. If you're a partner in a consulting firm, you want to make sure you've got a strong pipeline. You don't want to waste time on stuff that's never going to happen. The better the services procurement program is the better your supply chain will be in, in able to support and ensure that you deliver your objectives. Yeah, no, I totally agree. It's, it's a factor that often gets overlooked or yeah. underappreciated. Yeah. yeah. Um, and, it, and this is where, you know, services procurement and that extended capacity, the way it works most effectively is in a real kind of spirit of collaboration yeah. because it's so crucial. And a lot of the time, service providers will only be visible within a small silo um, within that, larger organization they might have a particular stakeholder who gets yep. to company x comes to company y brings them with them oh, yeah guys are great yeah but no one else in that organization no. knows about the great work that they're doing. yeah they don't even know that they're within the supply chain um that they're available that they have those capabilities so that internal visibility is something that we've seen people really appreciate and if you go back to our conversation about the c-suite so the ceo i expect would say oh yeah well, i gave you a nod on that program nick how's it going Put a dashboard together. If the supplier is a significant supplier or done some significant work, guess where their name and logo is going to be on my dashboard in front of the CEO, who's then going to say, "Oh, I didn't know about this this organisation." And the CEO might go and talk to the CFO or the CTO and say, "Oh, did you know we're working with X Y Z?" No. Okay. Well, and one of our top suppliers have just seen it on the dashboard, and there we go. Uh, and they, the the other thing is that that. Uh, if you put the 
quant qualitative view of that or rather the qualitative quantitative often those reports that go to c-suite are based around spend but if you're then doing spend versus performance yeah this is a really high performing firm that's of interest as much as how much we're spending with well, exactly and, and what are they, they must be doing good stuff for us and yeah so so it's a virtuous circle um but but it seems to be a quite a difficult one to to close that circle, yeah. I mean, yeah. It's uh, it, 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 when you get it into this context, it feels to me like a no-brainer. Uh, to, to yeah, use welcome that. to my world. Yeah, <laughs> that's why I said at the beginning is it's really simple, but it's all quite complex. Yeah. yeah. So the, the 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 view of it, it is quite a simple scenario in my view. I get it, um, uh, uh, and 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 most people I talk to get it. But then, yeah, all of the aspects we've been talking about it, but the things that that make it complex. But the other thing is, if you can't see this, if you're the CEO and you can't see this level of information, you don't understand value, uh, uh, you know, yeah. not just cost, you, you no. don't understand value, you could quite easily be mandating spend be cut that's crucial to your organization. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, and I'm sure that, you know, rather than just saying slash the consultancy budget or the IT services budget by X, it's like, well, let's understand what we're getting for that. How is that driving new product development? How is that driving revenue or profitability or efficiency within the organization? That's that's another area where it's not just on the, the growth side of it. It's on the side when people need to actually cut costs. You know, yeah. it might, the, the, it, maybe they should be investing more in certain services because it's driving growth. But very much so. But unless you've got the data, unless you understand what's going on within your business and how that is reflected in reality, yeah, you can't make that decision. It goes back to my decisioning point. So... Do you, slightly kind of a left field question, do you see many organizations utilizing um, kind of expressions of interest within their supply chain as a thing? What do you mean by expression? of interest? Effectively, where we see quite a few organizations that, that will basically go out to their supply chain and say, we haven't got a requirement as such, but we- Oh, uh, like up in RFI? Please. Yeah, like horizon <laughs> planning, that sort of stuff, where no. they're kind of saying, we've got stuff coming down, down the pipeline, um, do you have capabilities in this area, you know, emerging technologies and things like that that they know are going to come into it? That's something that we're seeing people utilizing. Yeah. And it, kind it, of in... automating much more now. Yeah. Where, where they get the whole supply chain holistically visible, they've got much more ability to say, you know, boardroom, yeah. this might be coming up. Do, yeah. Are we able to do that? Yeah. And, it, and that's when people can reach out to the supply chain more. And that's where supply chains can also potentially skill up quicker than organizations for new areas and things like that. But it's, it's quite interesting to see people using that as a bit of a kind of, like I say, horizon planning, early warning type stuff. Um, I've seen some good examples of it, I yeah. think, is the answer. And I said, no, not in general. Uh, I certainly have supported it. And in fact, in my, in my previous role, uh, championed it, you know, engagement with the supply chain. And I, and I saw recently on LinkedIn that they'd had a very, very successful supplier day, which was, I think part of that would have been you know, this is what's happening in our organization. Uh, we want to tell you about that so you can plan and, and come back to talk to us about how you can help us with some of that. I'm a huge advocate and I'm very pleased to see that that was a very successful day. Um, I think uh, there are some elements, uh, there are some uh, elements of organizations that do this quite well. The legal function is quite good at doing that. So they will hire uh, one of the one functions I've seen that do horizon plan. What regulatory changes are we expecting? Where, where do we need to be thinking about getting the law firms in to talk to them? When I've done law firm tenders, we we are, you know there was a, a a focus on horizon planning, but I think in, yeah. So there are, I have some examples of that. Uh, I wouldn't say that it was uh, standard in most places. Um, I th uh, uh, in general, uh, across the organisations I've worked with, uh, um, yeah, some are better than others. But I do, do see significant value in it. And again, I think it goes back to my conduit point that procurement is the conduit for that happening. Yeah. Bringing the suppliers into the organization and saying, this is my, you know, this is my marketing function. This is the, this is the suppliers in the marketing arena. Bring them in, in conjunction with maybe the CMO, uh, and doing that sort of, that sort of thing, I think is, is a, is a, very valuable part of procurement's role in a in a, in an organization great stuff okay so let's try and round things up 
And in the spirit of your uh, emphasis on simplicity, I see if I can set you a tricky task right. here. So how can we summarize, how would you summarize how you've identified that the opportunity here largely sits with procurement to make a change? How would you summarize how you think procurement can kind of step up to the plate and actually take take action on this? If you're going to summarize it, how can they what what can they do to step up to step up to the plate? Um so it's a really good question. Um I think they need to if I'm a if I was a CPO in another in an organization now, I'd be looking at well, what real value I brought to that organization. Um, and I've done quite a lot of work on this. And again, in previous roles, when we were transforming, transforming procurement, we looked at this and said, what are the really important things? You know, how do we deliver value? So yes, there are the, the metrics, you know, how, how quickly do we turn bids around? How quickly do we um, negotiate staff? How, how well do we manage the, the, the tick box exercise of making sure contracts don't, you know, expire and you know, I call it tick box it's a very important part of the compliance and government yeah. model right sorry everybody <laughs> um, but yeah you know so, so yeah we get that stuff right but actually are we are, is my function as an CPO transforming this business is it making a difference to the bottom line of this organisation and if it's not why and then the question is how would I make it so I might not know the answer to that, but I might then go and start talking to the CEO and the CFO saying, what do you think? You know, these these are the these are the things that I have within my function. You know, what what could I do to what do I keep doing? What do I stop doing? And what do I improve to, to meet your objective better? Because I want to, you know, have a vision of what you you think optimized procurement looks like within your function. And then you have a client. The client is the business. It takes me back to my sales days. What does the client need? Yeah. Once you understand what the client needs, you can develop your service around that. Um, yes, you've got hygiene factors, but also you've got this transformative element. And when you are transforming procurement, uh, you do need to understand what, what, what that needs to look like to support the organization. Because you are a function of the organization, but actually, are you a are you a strong enough functional organization to make a difference to the bottom line? You are, but there are a number of ways you can do that. Some will be more successful than others, but if you don't understand those, then uh, you may as well go home. And that's where, that's the start of the process where, as you say, the curiosity kicks in and you can, you can move forward. I like that. That's a very good, a good way to wrap things up. Um, well, listen, I've really enjoyed that conversation. I think there's, I've got, many more questions that we could we could discuss maybe uh, at a future point um but i've really enjoyed that and, and and as i say hopefully this conversation will if nothing else bring up some questions in other people um who might listen to it um but i really appreciate your time coming down and uh thank you johnny uh going through this and and, and answering the questions and giving your experience and your insights it's an honor to have been asked it's been great fun i really yeah. appreciate it thanks a lot thanks. cheers